for this final video, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to sit down because I want to use uh, my mouse to point out some things to you. So these are the major midstream companies, and I think what jumps out to you about this list is that you've never heard of most of them, if if any of them. So Inter Intertri Enterprise Products Partners, Energy Transfer, en Enbridge, Plains All American. These are the major companies. Not heard of TC Energy, but Kinder Morgan is another name I'm familiar with, and you probably aren't. And that just tells you about the nature of the business, that um, it, it's not the most name-grabbing business, but it's a pretty vital business. One thing I want you to be familiar with is the concept of a Master Limited Partnership, or MLP. MLPs are like C corporations in that they can be publicly traded and listed, which means they can be sold and they're liquid, but they're different than a C corporation in that they don't pay any corporate tax. The profits get passed directly to the Master Limited Partnership partners uh, through pass-through distributions. In some of my holdings, I have um, uh, I own some of these MLPs, um, and so it's a different taxation scheme. The idea is, is that way we don't have to pay tax twice, the famous double taxation. You can see that midstream companies are perfect to be MLPs and that they're right in the heart of the envelope of transporting and marketing the natural resources. And when times are relatively steady in the oil business, in theory, they produce some steady income. We're going to see how that works a little bit later in some of the profit issues. So here's Enterprise Product Partners, the biggest one. You can see they have a lot of pipelines and not really very many employees. Compare these two numbers. Just under 7,000 employees for almost $33 million. I'm sorry, $33 billion in revenue. And so that means that their employees generate some, somewhere between four and $5 million in revenue each. Well, that just talks about that it's a very capital intense business that once the pipelines are constructed, doesn't take as many people to make it running. Now you can see that their revenue was down from 18 to fiscal year 19. However, their profits were actually up. And so that's one of the things that is um, interesting about the midstream businesses. Oil prices can go up and down, but in theory, their cut kind of stays the same. And so some people say that midstream companies are, uh, they're not the boom and bust cycle, which is true, provided they get the same volume. And as we're seeing in the current crisis, when people shut in production, that means the volume goes down. And we'll talk a little bit about the contracts later, because that can become a factor too. They move product all over the United States. And I also wanted to show with you Plains All-American, their system map. Uh, not that it's markedly different, the business is markedly different than Enterprise, but notice that good old Wichita Falls is right here on the map, and I know that that's probably pretty hard to see. If you have ever driven on the east side of Wichita Falls and driven on this road out of town, it doesn't show up all that well uh, in the Google Earth video, but there are a bunch of white storage tanks, and this is Plains All-American. So they've got pipelines coming into this area, pipelines coming out of this area, and that is where uh, they have the storage capability as they move it around. Now, if you look on the photo, do you see anything leading to and from this tank farm that would indicate there are pipelines there? You can't. And that's part of why pipelines are so popular is once you bury them, you really can't see them. Let's go back again and focus on this issue of how pipeline access can affect ENP profitability. This chart is charting the the differential between oil sold in Midland, Texas, and in Cushing, Oklahoma. Remember, Cushing is kind of the pipeline nexus, and that's where the WTI price is quoted for the futures trading. And you can see that in the first several years of the oil production boom out in West Texas, there was enough pipeline takeaway capability that people weren't fighting over the pipelines. But as production grew, you start to see that there was not enough pipeline takeaway capability and people started to fight to get their products into pipelines. And when they fought to get their products into pipelines, the law of supply and demand says, hey, the pipeline companies can pay a lower price for the crude, basically becomes a downward spiral. And you see this huge price difference peaked out as much as $17.5 a barrel. Then as new pipelines came online, this differential went away. This is why you want to be in an area 
and the EMP companies where there is adequate takeaway capability with a pipeline. And so just to reinforce about those pipelines, here's an example of two of the pipelines that were constructed to increase the takeaway capability. The Cactus II was a Plains All-American pipeline. It cost just over a billion dollars. The Gray Oak is a Phillips 66 pipeline with partners. This one has some interesting spurs and it cost a little over $2 billion. What's interesting about both of these pipelines is where they're going. Where they're going is to the Corpus Christi area. And that's because after they uh, relieved the restrictions on the export of crude oil in 2015, there became markets to move these to the ports. Uh, there, are some, there are some refineries down in this area too, but this is a lot driven by the ability to export that oil. There is still a shortage of natural gas takeaway capability in the Permian. This is the Waha hub, which is the natural gas shipment point. And even this summer, you would see times where the natural gas prices were negative in Waha, which is saying the pipeline companies were actually being paid to carry them away. These are two natural gas pipelines that Kinder Morgan is actually in the process of constructing. One goes into uh, kind of close to that, that Houston market, and then you notice another one comes down here closer to the Corpus Christi market. And some of this has to do with where they're building the LNG plants, which is a concept that we'll talk about. Just noticed that I have a horribly misspelled word there on the chart. Well, my OCD-ness has been solved there. On the business perspective, because these are so expensive, typically what's, what companies will do is they will declare an open season. And what this is, is a time where the EMP companies get to bid to say, hey, I want to ship so many barrels of oil a month and I'll pay this price. And in theory, once the midstream companies see that there's enough of demand, then they'll go construct the pipeline. And then the beautiful thing is, is they've locked these companies in that they're going to ship so much oil at, for such and such a price. And this gives allegedly the stability in the ENP, I'm sorry, in the midstream profit margins. However, when does it become open season on the midstream companies? When, like we're seeing it today in the Permian, when production goes down and you start to see companies say, uh, particularly some of these EMP companies that go bankrupt, and that invalidates the contract they have with the pipeline company. Now the pipeline companies have to begin to scramble to fill their uh, capacity. So it's capital intense, and it is in fact more stable than the upstream business in terms of income, but it's not perfectly stable. And you can see that it does have a big impact on the EMP companies because it affects the price they can get for their oil. In class, we're going to look at some current trends in the pipeline construction market, and we're also going to look at the liquefied natural gas market. I look forward to our discussion.